Welcome to the Bulletproof Cashflow Podcast, the go-to place to gain financial freedom through real estate investing. Here we interview investors, mentors, and entrepreneurs who share their secrets and advice to help you build passive income. Let's get into the show. Hey everyone, this is Augustino. Building credibility in the multifamily real estate space is critical to getting deals sent your way. Aside from experience working deals, which is important, the marketing and branding of your message is how people recognize you as a thought leader. And of course, the bigger your influence in the real estate market, the more deals you get done. Well, today's guest, he's invested in over $50 million worth of real estate and currently owns 1,400 multifamily units. He began his real estate career by repositioning his first multifamily community as a property manager back in 2007 and went on to purchase his first multifamily property that same year. He attributes the use of social media to help him grow his business. As a firm believer of building these social networks both online and off, he's been able to organize Colorado's most active real estate meetup group. And as a testament to the power of networking, he's been able to leverage these networks to raise more than $5.2 million. He's also the host of the Creative Real Estate podcast where he shares what he learns with like thousands of listeners throughout the United States. Now, with all that, I'd like to welcome Adam Adams to the show. Hey, Adam, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Hey, Augustino. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So before we go on, if you like what Adam has to say, you can check out his company website at realbluespruce.com. And of course, if you like our content, please don't forget to leave a comment and rate the show. Okay, Adam, maybe give the listeners a brief intro as to how you got your start in real estate. Yeah, I got my start because my stepdad had always been involved in real estate. So I I grew up knowing that one day when I got old and boring, I would also be investing in real estate. So it was interesting because for a long, long time, he kept trying to get me to do this. Like in high school, he was telling me I needed to buy real estate, that I needed to invest 10%. He was also trying to get me to start my own businesses in high school. And finally, when I was, you know, a couple of years into college, he, I think, just lacked patience. And so he purchased a piece of land and then he gave it to me uh, for Christmas. And then he made me pay him the same exact price that he paid for it right after <laughs> to help him with his taxes. But that's really how I got my start. I grew up with it and my dad, you know, wouldn't let me say no in any way. He kind of forced it upon me. Bought that piece of land. A couple of years later, though, I sold it for a profit, for a huge profit. I spent $100 on purchasing the property and uh, sold it for $12,000. And so after real estate commissions, made an 8,000% return on my money. And I said, this is powerful. So I started learning about Robert Kiyosaki. I found out that he, what he focused on was multifamily. So I just said to myself, I need to focus on multifamily. He skipped single family, even though he kind of tells people to do single family. If he skipped it, I should just go ahead and skip it. But how am I going to do that? So that kind of brings us to um, what you mentioned in the intro. I started managing a, a property in 2007. And we were able to add a million dollars to the value of it, the owner sold it and put almost a million bucks in his pocket. And so after that, I said, now it's time for me to start owning multifamily. So in 2008, I, I started focusing on it. Instead of single family and other things, I started focusing on multifamily 11 years ago. Nice. Good, good, good. So, and that was right at the beginning of the crash, right? I mean, 2007, that's when things were still okay until 2008 when the wheels fell off the economy and it was just a disaster. Yeah. And in Utah, we didn't feel it right away. And it started getting worse a year after and even worse two years after people started losing jobs and losing their homes. But, you know, just real fast, one random interesting thing is during that same time when a lot of people were, you know, losing their jobs and losing their homes, multifamily, you know, was still very strong. So I, I I did okay in that property and I continue to look back at the last time there was a recession, multifamily had less than a 1% default rate in it. And so I'm, I'm always feeling a lot better about that than having a bunch of single family rentals. I've got a friend who lost 2000 houses that were only leveraged at 30% on the dollar. Oh. They were only leveraged at 30% and he lost all 2000 of them. So anyway, that... 
probably won't happen with multifamily. So I'm really focused on that. Well, exactly. Yeah, I, I think the, the, I know that statistic. It's point zero or point four percent by Fannie and Freddie. They put that stat out back in 2008 when the, like, the whole world was falling apart. The actual default was only point four. It's insane. Yeah, but it's a, it's because it's a business, though, right? And all those people needed a place to go. And where else are they going to go? But you know, to us multifamily guys, it's exactly where they're going to be, right? Yeah. But that's interesting. So now with, with social media, I mean, really social media took hold, really it's become a lot more popular more recently. But even back then, back in the 2008, it still wasn't as hot as it is now. But is that when, uh, like, when did you realize that social networking was really where it's at and where you need to put your focus on? It, it wasn't until about 2016. I was new to a new city. Well, the city wasn't new, but I was new here. And I was trying to figure out how to grow a network because people say your network is your net worth. And so if they are correlated and I knew nobody in the city, I needed to figure out something. So I really reverse engineered all the options that I had to become a thought leader and, and help people to know who I was and what I was doing. And so it took some time, but... We were able to create the top meetup in the state of Colorado in about a year, year and a half. Our meetup became, you know, number one of any meetup, let alone real estate meetups. But if you just add up the next, uh, the second best, the third best, the fourth best, and the fifth best um, real estate meetup, we were still twice as big as all of them combined. And a lot of that had to do with how I marketed it. So I put more on social media than anyone, anyone else that was doing real estate meetups and it put us at the top very fast. Okay, so when you're, you're pushing everything on social media to really market the, the meetup, right? And to, to grow it that fast. So what sort of things were you posting on, on social? Like were you just letting people know that it existed? Were you posting statistics about, about real estate? Like how, how'd you get those people that weren't really real estate people? Maybe I'm assuming that's what you're getting. How'd you get them to, to come out? Okay. So it's all marketing and sales. I think um, anybody who's got any kind of business and especially a real estate business should be really good at sales and marketing. And so here's some of the tricks that we use to get people to come to our events so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna make some notes of of things that we can uh, really talk about. Scarcity is one. Lemmings is the next topic that I'd like to talk about. Those would be pretty pretty good. Okay, so first off, I tricked people in a way by I would fluctuate the cap of how many people were allowed to come to the meetup. So I'd fluctuate the cap. So at first I might say that. The cap is 10 people, for instance. I mean, this is something anyone could do. Really, my caps were never that low. But if you're starting out a meetup and you're wanting to create scarcity to be able to do sales and marketing, maybe create a cap of 10 people and then private message people and until you get the 10. And then go on your Facebook and say, man, we completely sold out. We had to get a bigger venue. And then you up it to 15. <laughs> <laughs> and you private message some people, get five more people to say they want to, and then you go on social media. This is the second time we're having to relocate the venue. I'm so sorry, guys. Now we got a place that's big enough for everybody, and then you change it to 20. And you just do something like that where human beings, when they realize that you, know, you only have five spots left, you only have three spots left, they see that... Not only is it valuable, it's a valuable event, it's a valuable organizer, it's valuable content because they see like humans are like lemmings. And, you know, I'm not bad mouthing anybody. I am a lemming. I like social proof. When I see that people are all listening to the same podcast and there's hundreds of people listening, thousands of people listening to somebody's podcast, I say, well, that. That makes sense. Now I should also listen to that podcast. So you use things like this in your marketing 
where you, you're like, I'm so sorry, we, we sold out again. We had to get it to a bigger venue. We were completely maxed out. I called the venue. I asked them if they could fit more. They said that they were going to go ahead and open up five more seats. So if you want in and you, and you were sitting on the wait list before, hop in right now because there's only five seats available. Beautiful. So you're using the 25 cognitive biases. That's one of the 25. Co- Actually, you mentioned two of them right there. Yeah. So scarcity and um, social proofing. Yeah. And then the other couple of tricks that I would do, and I still use to this day when I just when I sell anything, when I sell my coaching program, when I sell my investing in our deals passively, I use these strategies to make it so people feel more comfortable that other people are also investing in this deal. Other people like them, you know, feel felt found. They also felt nervous about investing in a deal. I felt the same way. I get where you are, how you feel. I felt the same way. And what I found was after doing my research on this market, that it's one of the top markets in the country. It's something that we can feel very comfortable about. It's a it's a safer place to put our money than, you know, a lot of the other cities. And not only that, but I know how you feel about being concerned about what the business plan is. I felt the same exact way. When I first looked at the business plan, it looks like it's a difficult lift. It's going to take a lot of time and effort. And that's why I went ahead and partnered with these other partners or this property management company, because yeah, at the end of the day, I found that they've done things just like this. And my other investors that know that I'm working with them feel more comfortable now to partner in on this deal. Do you want in? Because we only have a couple spots left. We're, we're practically full. And if, if you want in, you got to tell me now because I'm going to give it to someone else. So you take it away, right? If it's not you, I'm going to go ahead and give this to someone else. So these are strategies to use when you're raising private money. These are strategies to use when you're selling a coaching program. These are strategies to use when you're selling a vacuum. I'm sorry, this is the last vacuum of the day, sir. If you want it, great. But if not, I'm sure your neighbor will take it and it's going to change their life. It's going to (laughs) benefit them so much. They're going to throw away the other vacuums. And I'm sure they want to buy two of them, one for upstairs, one for downstairs. But I only have one left. So... Or you can just, you can go ahead and take it. I'm here right now and I don't even have to talk to your neighbor. So, yeah. Those are very two powerful cognitive biases that I think they're the most common ones, actually. The ones most common used is going to be social proof and scarcity. There, it's funny because I, I often talk about the cognitive biases on my, on my on the show before, uh, but also in my coaching as well. This is integral to actually doing sales. You know, you got to have it. It's a must. So I actually have a, a document that I'll, I'm going to share out with everybody. It's, it's actually, it's not my document, but it's one that I found. I think it's uh, Ty Lopez put it together for uh, based off of uh, Charlie Munger's the 25 Cognitive Biases. That's great stuff. Okay. So aside from, aside from the meetups then, social media. So how are you building your communities and are, are you leveraging the same sort of uh, tools and the same sort of strategies to get those sorts of, get people involved on your on your social media side like on Facebook and um, Instagram? I am and as you were talking about that I hurried and made notes of five different things that the listeners can really take away from from posting on social media to really get a strong thought leadership platform there. And so here's the five, and we can dive into them. I would say yeah. post more questions. Most people, so you could say this like ask, don't tell. Most people are like so proud of themselves and they want to tell everybody, tell the world everything about them. But I would say ask, don't tell. For instance, just today I, I made a post that was, I'm going to create a podcast on this topic and I'd love your help. Can you give me three reasons why you should pay off your house or three reasons why you should not pay off your house, uh, your mortgage? And don't just read everybody else's comment. Come up with your own personal like reasons. And so people, they want to be famous. They want to get on the podcast. 
people don't just scroll through it because I didn't just tell them something. I asked them something. And so now they're creating more engagement on the post, which I'll tell you more about how that really benefits you. They want to be a part of it. They want to contribute to society. These are all normal things. So post more questions. Ask, don't tell. Okay. Ask, don't tell. The next one that I will talk about is posting videos. Okay. So Again, going to the cognitive bias, you might be able to record videos or take pictures while you're at your meetup, while you're at somewhere, and you say, look at this, we're sold out room, and you know, tell us what you learned. And then you might say, hey, if you're not here, you missed out. You, know, you make people feel like they missed out. If you're not here, you missed out. Uh, the next one's going to be at this one time. But why do post the video. A couple of reasons. One's because people need to see your face. They need to hear your voice. They need to experience the surroundings, the ambiance, the the people that they missed out on being around. And they missed out on ha- being able to have these takeaways. So now they're more likely to come to the next one. But that's not the only reason you post videos. The additional reasons are because fewer people post videos. So Facebook actually has algorithms that favor when you post a video. So not only are you doing all of these other great things, and if your video can have more questions and make people want to engage on that video, will also allow Facebook to push that in front of more and more and more people than if you just made a post. The third one is posting lives. Okay, so if you actually do a live video from like your meetup group or you do a live video, like I do sometimes when I record my podcast, I'll actually go on Zoom and import it into Facebook Live at the time that we're recording. And I, you know, my listenership grew huge just by doing that one thing because Facebook's algorithms hugely favor the Facebook Live. If you're on Facebook, you'll notice that even when it's not currently live, anytime your friends go live, Facebook puts it in front of you like all day. Yeah, You cannot get away from it. So this is just another way to grow your influence. The fourth thing that I wanted to mention is really truly creating engagement. The first part of creating the engagement starts with ask, don't tell. But the part that I do that almost nobody else does is after asking the first question and somebody replies. So as you remember, I mentioned earlier that this morning I posted something on my Facebook that just said, I'm going to have a podcast about this subject and I need your help. Give me three reasons why you should pay off your mortgage or three reasons why you should not pay your mortgage. And don't just copy other people's information. Give me your unique answer. And people would write things on there. They have written things on there. It got super big engagement, by the way. And then I went in and I said, thank you for leaving this. This is valuable information. In the second one, you said that you're saving interest. If you have an interest, you're being able to deduct. How does that work? How do you know that you can really deduct this interest? Did it change Did that interest deduction change in the last time that we created a tax reform? Um, Is that still valid after Trump was president or whatever? So you just, you say thank you. And then you basically ask a follow-up question like, oh, you mentioned this, but have you ever thought about this? Or, you know, you just want to have that friend keep making comments. So when you do it right, when you are engaging and asking follow-up questions over and over, Facebook sees that and they have a huge um, incentive, Facebook does, to keep people on the platform. So if you're posting links or something and people have to go off of Facebook, they don't like that. So as soon as they see that, the algorithms say, shut this off. Don't let people see the link that they're posting. Oh, they're posting a YouTube video. That's competition. That's going to get them off of us and onto YouTube. And they're just going to binge watch a bunch of YouTube videos. This is a red flag. We cannot show this. But when you are doing the opposite and and engaging with your audience, asking more questions, they say, wow, whenever Adam Adams posts a video or anything on here, whenever Adam Adams posts something, 
people seem to comment. And then Adam seems to reply to those comments. So I'm keeping Adam engaged on Facebook for a really, really long time. And Adam's keeping all of these other people engaged. So I'm going to go ahead and open this post up to his entire database. Because if I do, I will make more money for Facebook and my investors. So create engagement. That was number four. And the fifth one that I feel like can be very valuable to your audience is adding value. So number one, this podcast is full of value. This podcast, you are adding value. I'm trying to add true value, actionable content. And people are on the edge of their seat wanting to know how to add value. They're wanting to know how to create engagement. They're wanting to know how to do lives. Now they're able to say, wow, just these small little tweaks on my Facebook, instead of telling, I can start asking. Now they're getting actually true, true value. So the more you do that, the more that your content is is something that people want to hear, the next time you post they're going to be looking out for it. They're going to be wanting to see it. And part of the huge benefit that I've gotten, and I'm hoping that your listener will feel this way, see this, be able to taste and touch it, and also be able to say, I want that for myself. So just because of adding a massive amount of value on Facebook, you know, Rod Cleef asked me to be on stage at his events. Michael Blanc asked me to be on stage at his events. Dave Lindahl asked me to be on stage at his events. And these are three of the biggest um, multifamily educators, three of them. And they found me because of my Facebook presence. And they want to put me on their stage to help other people. Now, if, if I was the exact same human being and I loved people just as much and I loved and I still had 1,400 real estate doors or whatever but I wasn't posting on Facebook, I would miss out. I would lose out. Michael Blanc never would have called me. Rod Cleef never would have called me. You might not have called me to be on your podcast either. So add true value. It will always come back at you. And as an example, think of a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary V. V double E. Not everyone knows him, but most people that are trying to understand this do know him. He wrote this book and it's called Jab, Jab, Right Hook. And as he was creating the book, he told his publisher, I will not publish this book unless you let me call it Jab, 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 Right Hook. And the producer's like, that's ridiculous. We're going to call it Jab, Jab, Right Hook. And he was adamant. He did, almost didn't even publish that video because he was he was so attached to the idea that you need to give the value, give the value over and over and over before you ever say, I've got a coaching program around this, or uh, you can hire my team as consultants to get you to the next level. He was so serious about it. Now, knowing that someone like Gary Vee is mindset is about add value, add value, add value over and over repeatedly before you ever ask for anything, before you ever offer a product or a service. It shows where he is. He's probably one of the top two influencers in the nation right now. Uh, Grant Cardone is, is super high up there. Almost everybody knows him. They follow him. Anthony Robbins, Tony Robbins, it does this. They it's just value after value, video after video, content after content. But when those three need you to invest in their deal, when those three need to partner with you, when they those three have a one day mastermind for forty thousand dollars, people pay it immediately. They might make a million dollars on, or even five million or ten million dollars on one single event because they jab, jab, jabbed forever until they threw that right hook. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, that's, and that's the point, though, too. They, they put out so much content, they very rarely ever ask for anything. I know that. And, and if they do, they're very smart about how they ask. It'll get buried into the whole discussion. Grant Cardone is a great example. He'll talk about his training program probably towards the beginning, and then he'll, start, then he'll educate you on what NOI is, for instance. I mean, his... The way that he lays it out, Gary Vee doesn't really ask for anything at all in his in his stuff. So um, yeah, great stuff. But see, 
having, I mean, you put on your podcast, we have ours, we, we do a lot of other things too. A great deal of work goes into just doing what we do. How are you arranging for all these other people? Or I'm guessing you have all these other team, you have a, you have a team of people that help you with all this stuff, right? Yeah, so the way it works in my team, it might be a little bit unique because my main focus is just branding, just getting on podcasts, just hosting events, just adding value. And in my team, I don't do underwriting. When somebody says, I've got a deal that you guys might be able to close, I put them in touch immediately with somebody else on the team. I might have a lot of the first-hand conversations with passive investors, but somebody else on the team is the investor liaison. I don't asset management. I'm not a property manager. I own lots of units, but I don't manage them myself. I have other people on the team. So depends on who you are, the size of your team, and how you want to do this. I, in particular, focus most of my day on getting in front of our target audience and other people on the team make sure that the rest of it can handle can be handled all the time. So yes, you do need a team. I feel like you do need a team. And if I personally had to focus on asset management and acquisitions and raising money in our company, I wouldn't have the time or effort to be able to be noticed on social media or our events. Yeah. I mean, it's, it'd be very, very difficult. I mean, right now, my team and I, we're currently looking for deals. We range for financing, produce podcasts, produce other materials just about every day where it's, we're putting new content out. And I have a hand in just about everything. So I know, <laughs> I feel your pain. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. All right. So in terms of content then, so we talked a little bit about the five main points. And I noticed that as far as your video is concerned, in engaging on that, what sort of videos are you actually putting out there then? Are you actually putting out, I mean, I, I've seen some of it before, but maybe you can elaborate more as to what, what are you doing out there and what's your expectation in return when you do put something out there? Awesome. Here's a really good question. I believe that the listener, if they do implement this, I mean, just this one question, if they hear the answer and they can actually take action, on the answer, the response here is worth thousands and thousands and thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to any listener. So in terms of creating and building content, you have to do what Stephen Covey says. Begin with the end in mind. So you start out by understanding why are you even creating the content in the first place? What do you want out of this? Who in the world is out there? Who in the world would be perfect for you to know? And how do you provide the most amount of value to that one person? So when I teach my students how to raise equity, I focus on helping them to get in front of either IT professionals or doctors and dentists or attorneys, engineers. Absolutely. I teach them how to speak to their specific audience and add the most amount of value for a doctor or dentist or an attorney or an engineer or a high uh, a CEO or CFO, how do you talk to them? How do you give them value about maybe investing passively in multifamily? And when you understand your audience perfectly and you create maybe what's called an avatar, you can spend time designing and understanding what does that person want to know what type of topic will that person naturally start viewing? And how do I speak in order to have them stay on the video? And what is my call to action at the end of the video or somewhere in the middle of the video, how they might be able to reach out to me and I can teach them more on how to vet an operator or I can teach them more on what the tax benefits of being involved into multifamily are. So that's what we start with. We reverse engineer the process. We begin with the end in mind and we answer who is our target audience. I have a different target audience than like I teach my clients. 
My client is my target audience. I focus on helping them to be able to raise money. So I offer uh, free content on my social media that the, the type of person that I want to work with naturally starts following me. And then when I can share that I teach you how to brand yourself, then they'll naturally say, okay, Adam's already given me a lot of free ideas on this, but I don't exactly know where to start. So if I'm going to choose somebody to work with, I'm going to choose Adam Adams. Another idea in this that's very helpful that I learned from a guy that works in our office that really helps uh, propel the role that I have in the company, he talks about this thing called drawing a line in the sand. Okay, Grant Cardone draws his line in the sand. He says you would be dumb to have own your own house where you live. Other people draw their line in the sand. You shouldn't pay off your mortgage, etc. So when uh, we talk about your finding your target audience and resonating with them, you figure out that whatever your line in the sand is, you're either with me or you're against me. You're either on this side of the line or you're an outcast. I was listening to Dave Ramsey, and he's he's got this. He talks about how the paid-off mortgage is the new status symbol above the BMW, right? So that's his line in the sand. When people buy new cars, he says, you're stupid. You know, It's very abrasive, but it divides your audience, and it helps people say, you know, Dave is saying things no one else says. Adam Adams might be saying, you know, why would you ever try to learn all of the parts of, of multifamily? Why would you want to wear every single hat? Instead, just raise equity, just brand yourself, and now you're valuable to lots of people and the deals will find you. When I put my line in the sand and say, I'm a different type of educator, or when you, as somebody who's raising equity and you're trying to help other people, you need to have a line in the sand, something around why you shouldn't invest in the stock market or something uh, involved of, of why the tax benefits are the greatest with this asset class or why you would never want to do a CD. So you kind of make that abrasive thing so that your audience is, they resonate with lots, much of what you say, but when you give that line in the sand, they're more inclined to say, you know what? He or she is the only one saying this. I want to partner with them. I want to passively invest with them. So you got to figure out who is your target audience. What do they want to hear? And what are your ways of helping you to stand apart from other people in your space that are also raising private equity for their deals? How exactly are you different? Are you safer? Are you focused on one market? Are you focused on lots of markets? Are you focused on multiple real estate investing strategies? Do you have the strongest team? Whatever it is, draw your line in the sand and show everybody why you do it differently. Yeah, it's part of uh, finding your tribe, right? And not everyone's going to like you. And that's okay. That's fine. The tribe is going to be your biggest supporter and they're going to be there when you need them the most. That's the thing. It's uh, absolutely true. So now when you're talking to these individuals, uh, let's say in a live setting, are you changing your questions depending on the personality that you're talking to? You know, like if you're talking to an action-based person versus a practical person versus an emotional person or a social person, how do you, how do, you do that kind of stuff? Or do you do it? I do it. It's difficult to teach it, especially on a podcast. You have to play to the player. So there's these games, you know, called apples to apples. There's other games that that you play these cards and you, and you play to the player. Like I'm a tuba player. I was a I played, you know, in the band. I love music. I love composing music. And so my sister knows that if she plays a card that says tuba or orchestra or band or composition, I'm more likely to pick that card than the other cards that people have dealt because it resonates with me. And so when in sales, you want to know exactly how somebody ticks. And it's difficult to teach that over a podcast. You have to like be in a room and bounce ideas back and forth. And it might even take months to teach somebody else that same skill of asking good questions opening up the 
until they strike. That's the biggest problem that I have seen with people that I have worked with is that they hear me say the questions and it works. And so they just try to ask the exact same questions to any random person. But intuitively, I wouldn't ask those questions to those people. I asked it to certain people because I need to understand how do you tick before I can offer something. I always share this, and I think this will be beneficial, at least. Two things. One, we're going to talk about tools in your tool shed. And number two, we're going to talk about a doctor diagnosing you, okay? So you are a handyman, and you've got all sorts of tools with you. Now, if you had tools to lay carpet, and you were trying to put in a window, you'd be screwed. You would not be able to put that window in with your carpet stretcher. Same thing as if you were on a roof trying to fix the swamp cooler. You can't do that with a carpet stretcher. If you're a handyman, you have to understand all of the situations that you can get in, and you have to ask enough questions. You have to find out the exact diagnosis of the problem that you are, need to create before you say, take two aspirin and call me in the morning. So if you ask the same exact question in all situations, you would lose. So when a doctor comes in, they're like, does it hurt here? What happens if you turn your head? Does your throat hurt? What did you eat for breakfast? What were you doing the day that you injured this? And uh, let's take some x-rays and understand it. They figure all of that out before they give you your prescription. They don't just write random prescriptions that worked for the last person that came into the doctor. They need to be careful to build it for this person. And so if you want to be a good doctor or you want to be a good handyman or if you want to be able to sell really well either your coaching program or your investment opportunity, then you need to understand how to figure out how does that person tick? What do they need to accomplish? What are their investment goals before you say you should invest passively into this deal? Because if you, if you go straight for the kill and say, I think you should invest passively in this deal before they understand the market, before you understand if, if they have enough money to invest or what their risk tolerance is, if you try to just put this in a box and, and tell them that they need to do it, they're going to do the same thing that a girl would do on a first date if you said, I love you, I want to marry you. They would freak out. They would turn around and walk away. The same thing that would happen if you went to the doctor and you had a pain that was in your shoulder for the last two months and the doctor said, these two aspirin will help it feel better. Leave. Leave the office. You'd be like, wait, what? So anyway, when you kind of just boil it down, it comes down to this. You just have to ask better questions. When you truly understand what's going on, not only are you better at helping them, but they're also better at receiving your diagnosis. Absolutely, absolutely. One of the things that I do is I listen to the types of questions that they're asking me first. So I, I'll typically ask, what's your overall goal? What's important to you? And if, they, if their response is something like, you know, I really need to get something moving because if I don't, I feel like I'm, I'm behind the eight ball or I'm missing out on something. That tells me that they're an action-based person. So delivering a potentially expeditious response would be, or solution rather, would be what to tell them to get them involved with whatever it is I'm working on, at least getting it started. You don't just go in and say, I love you and I want to marry you to them, but you have to calibrate what you're saying and how you're saying it to the person you're speaking to, you know, whether they're they're practical, that's a different, that's a different scenario, or, or an action or or a social person. Maybe they want to get to know you. Well, they always want to get to know you, but maybe they want to get a whole bunch of drinks and play a golf game before they actually even think about doing business with you. You know, that kind of thing. Right. So calibrating that is super important. But I guess when you're dealing with people, then I know you're really big on now, maintaining that contact, getting those those email lists, right? You're, I know you're really big on that. So now, how are you doing that? How are you building those email lists out to, to maintain that communication with them? And then what are you doing to maintain that communication with them in terms of material and whatnot? Yeah, so for our passive investors, we 
have a podcast that adds value and teaches them how to be involved and offers that if they want to be involved passively and kind of get their feet wet and maybe I suggest that you put the minimum investment in, if that type of thing makes sense and and you want to have that conversation, then the next thing that you're going to want to do, and again, we assume the sale and we also, so two things, you always assume the sale and number two, you always help somebody visualize exactly what they're about to do. Anything of sales, right? So on our podcast, we'll say something like, if you want to stop worrying about this, or if you want to passively invest and and take your first step into multifamily, then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to first, you give them step by step. First, you're going to want to type in realbluespruce.com. Then you're going to want to go up at the top there's a place where it says, get on the list. You just want to click that. And after you click that, you're going to just simply put in your email and your name, and that's it. Now what's going to happen is we're going to start showing you the deals that we have. We're going to start educating you more as the each week, we'll probably give you one or two emails that kind of give you some, some real true advice of how to protect yourself when being a passive investor. And then every now and again, when we have a great deal and we vet like a hundred of them before we ever say yes to one, once we have that screaming deal, by the way, they move fast. They always move fast. We don't ever need to you know, work with you, but we would love to if this benefits you. So when we have that deal, it's probably going to be open for maybe a week, maybe two weeks if it's a big raise. And so you're going to have to not only say that you want to be involved in it, but you're going to be, you're going to actually need to sign all these documents and wire the money in a short period of time if you want to work with us on that deal. So that's what it looks like. If you would like to get involved passively so that you can learn the ropes actively, go ahead and go to realbluespruce.com and click get on the list. And now they feel like it would be easy for them to hop on the list. They've walked through the whole process with them. They're not confused about anything. When they are confused about something, they have dissonance in their heart. It won't let them make the next step because they don't know what's going to happen. So you need to give them the step by step by step of what will happen when they want to invest passively with you. And by the way, this is not a high pressure thing, right? You go ahead and just hop on the list so you can get some more education and you can see the deals that we have in case they work for you. Now they feel like, okay, it's not going to harm me to get on the investor list. Adam's not going to call me every day and be like, you have to invest in this deal. It's easy for him to fill it up anyways because he has a lot of past investors. So he's not going to high pressure me. So I might want to do that. Now they understand what it's like and they can get on. And then the next part that you mentioned, because you really did ask, how do you get people on your list? And so that's the first part that I just shared with you. The second part is how do you maintain that list? Mm -hmm. And so as the maintaining, what you'll want to do as somebody who's going to start having a passive investor list, what you want to do, what you are going to do, that's going to make you successful is to first create the content. When we talked about reverse engineering the process, create the content that helps your target audience. And so you'll actually write several emails. You'll actually probably have a quick text code. And when you hear this and you're like, only big businesses do quick text codes, text raising money to 555-888, text, you know, get on the list to whatever, one, two, three, four, five, six. We're listening to this podcast and we're saying, only big companies do that. Well, I'm not ready for that. I don't need to do that. Well, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. You need to start having these quick text codes. You need to start creating the content. You need to have the white page. You need to write a book. You need to have a podcast. You need to have a consulting, whatever it is. You need to do some of these things because when you have created that content ahead of time, it can become automated. So you don't have to sit there and write a bunch of emails and always stay on top. You create it ahead of time. You understand what they want ahead of time. And then you allow for that to automatically go in front of them by a slow drip campaign on your MailChimp or whoever you use. 
Right, right. So who's writing that content? Are you you writing it personally or do you have other other writers to help you with it? Usually in our team, DJ writes most of the content. And because I am really intent on delivering things the right way so that it's not high pressure or so that people can see the next step by step by step, because I used to sell door to door. I love sales. I, I think it's fun. I think it's exciting. I feel really good about it because that's my personality. I like to look at what is created and tweak just a couple of words so that it gets super powerful for our passive investors. So he'll usually create it. The whole team will create the topics. Like we'll sit down and we'll create a hundred different topics and then. DJ will bullet point it, outline it, create the content, and I'll just tweak it. I'll just say, for instance, just a random example. Instead of saying apartment complex, let's just change that to apartment community. I want my passive investor to see this as people, not just a a building. I want them to feel that we're helping a lot of human beings out, not just simply there to talk about a property, just bricks and mortar, and that's it. And so we'll just tweak small things like that so that it can give us better impressions, better understanding, more clarity, more step-by-step as our viewer reads that email. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. I mean, having a good copywriter is, is paramount too, especially the velocity that you're putting information out there it it really it really helps i'm i'm guessing right i mean you really have to have a you have a whole team there really backing you up and helping you through that stuff it's that's amazing it's great stuff changing it up a little bit now how do you see your business changing over the next 5 years uh, with all with all the social media stuff maybe with with how you think the economy is going to pan out over the next 24 months we keep hearing a lot of different things about where the economy is going taking all that into account how do you see your business changing or do you see it changing at all well you know, the main part of that is I don't really see the economy could change, but it it won't really change our business plan. Uh, we'll still be doing what we're doing. You know, markets go up, markets are go, go down. And as you know, the last time we had a recession, multifamily was still very strong. You talked about less than a 1% default rate. So anyway, what I do see though, to answer your question is, is those people who, who listen to this podcast and know how strong it can be to get on social media, They will lose the game if they don't start practicing reaching out and having some type of thought leadership for their passive investors. So for us, we're going to keep going and we're going to, we're going to, you know, always have what we need. But if someone hears this and they don't get on social media and do it the right way, they just won't have that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All right, guys, if you want to reach out to Adam, you can reach him via the website, his website at realbluespruce.com. I hope you got a lot of great insight on social media on how to build a powerful network to help your business grow and succeed and some of the traps to avoid as well. Don't forget to check out his podcast, Creative Real Estate uh, on iTunes. Thanks for your time, Adam. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the Bulletproof Cashflow Podcast. For more free podcasts, articles, videos, and resources, go to www.bulletproofcashflow.com. 